You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey everybody, it's Mike Rohde. I'm here with Alec Pulianis once again at the end of another season, season 11. Alec, how you doing? Doing well. This is a really enjoyable season. I think there were a lot of good tips and that's what we're going to highlight today. That's exactly right. We've gathered, just like uh, Season 10, our experiment, we really liked it. And the idea is to take all the tips, slice them out of the episodes, and then lay some nice inspirational music behind the tips. So you can sort of listen to them all in one go, um, or you can jump back and forth if you want to hear them again. It's just a way to have a reflection episode at the end of the season, so you can remember what all the season, because, you know, it was pretty long, and um, that will let you sort of reflect on the ones that you like best, and maybe you'll be encouraged to pick up those old episodes and listen to them again because they're they're good. So what we want to do now is just take a minute each and sort of highlight a favorite tip of our own. So we, we've each picked a tip that we like. We'll talk for a few minutes, and then we'll get started and let you listen to each of the tips in full. So Alec, let's start with you. What were what was one of your what was your favorite tip or one of your favorite tips? Yeah, I think you might take my my very favorite from the whole season, but. Uh... My favorite, or one of my other favorites, was uh, Tame Vora's tip about constraints will help you keep on track. I think all too often, particularly for creative types, we try to do more, or we try to aspire towards the level of art we like to enjoy ourselves. And sometimes, like, we're just not there yet, or um, it's not maybe the kind of art that we should be producing. And being able to constrain yourself you know not have to worry about gear for instance right if you're if you're always worried about gear that's why i always tell people like the gear doesn't matter you just have to have like the eye for it or the the vision for it and you can get there uh and you can create really meaningful art and um i was talking to you right before the show of how i find myself i watched some of your videos about drawing and keeping it to simple shapes for me has actually resulted in me able to draw things I couldn't draw before because I was trying to make it too photorealistic, for instance. Um, but now that I'm kind of simplifying it, um, I feel like I'm actually creating notes that are valuable, mm. right? Or And I can I can make them quicker. Mm. It's almost like sometimes when you kind of overdo a process, you're doing more steps because you think it's going to make it better. But in reality, <laughs> if you did it the simpler way, you couldn't tell the difference, right? So that's right. That kind of that kind of a concept. My favorite tip, which I think we both shared, was uh, Chris Wilson, uh, episode 12. And he talked about creating something that's just for you and not for public consumption. And I really like that because I think one of the challenges I see is, especially in sketchnoting, it's lots of posts on Instagram. And it feels like there's sort of a draw of Instagram. I feel it where it's sort of like beckoning to me. You need to post something. You need to post something. Look at all these people and all the great things they're doing with their lives. You should post. And I have to resist that actively. And I think, you know, there's lots of things that I do that I don't post publicly that I just keep for myself. And so this sort of aligned well with sort of my mindset of having things that are just for me, or maybe I show them to a few close friends, but nobody else. Like everything, not everything has to be posted publicly for your whole life, right? So I think that's a good reminder for me that I'm one of my goals is to do that, to keep some private things just for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And also sometimes it can uh, almost backfire in a way, right? Like I, I sometimes don't show some of the creative work I do for no other reason than like the expectation of more. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to do any more, you know, like that, that was like a one-off thing of just something I was doing and I enjoyed it and I do enjoy doing it, but I, I don't want the expectation of like, like you said, like, oh, there'll be more on the way, more posts, more this, more that. Yeah, it just, the expectations go up, right? Right, yeah, and it's like, yeah, I, it, it's the uh, the classic, um, the first album by a band should always be their best because, uh, or could be their best because they had all the time in the world to create it. And then after they create like their hit album, now they want another one in a year or two. And, they don't, you know, it could have, they could have taken five years to write the first one. <laughs> you didn't know right. that. <laughs> so, right. stuff like that. That's That's pretty cool. So, so those are our two favorite tips from, or one from each of us, two total. And uh, probably the last thing we'll say before we get you to the tips is we're excited to be lining up for this fall. I think probably September, October, something like that for season 12. I've already lined up some recordings with some great guests. I think you're going to like these guests as well. I feel like um, as we go on, the guests keep getting better. And we have, it's crazy to think we've been doing this 
for so long and there's such a deep recording. So if you've not looked back in the archives, go back in the archives uh, at sketchnotearmy.com slash podcast. There's over a hundred podcast episodes and lots of interesting people. Maybe there's maybe what we should do is have a uh, maybe a season 13. We'll go back and invite some people that have been on in the past and sort of do a, a catch up episode. We'll have to think about that. But we definitely have a deep catalog if you want to check out a good visual thinking person talking about what they do. So with that, I think, uh, Alec, thanks for making time. And let's go ahead and roll these tips. Paul Mignard. Well, number one is, I'll say what's benefited me the most is the habit, like getting in the Mm. habit of making and posting content continuously. Now, posting might not be your thing. You know, I I know not, not everybody's into social media, but for me, it was it was really cool. Like I, you know, the when I first made the intention, like, all right, I am going to sketch note every Sunday and post it regardless. That really not only did it it brought tomorrow today, right? Because I think a lot of times we're like, oh, tomorrow I'll work on this and tomorrow I'll work on that. And it almost brought it to here, like, okay, well, I made a commitment to myself that I'm gonna post. And it was small enough to where it wasn't a hassle. Like it wasn't Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to post three times a day and I'm going to juice my followers and blah, blah. No, it was just like, I, you know, whatever happens, I'm going to post once a week. And if I can do that, that'll be successful. And pretty quickly, once a week turned into twice a week and then three times a week. And that paid dividends for me personally, Mm -hmm. because now I was, you know, I was committing to something. It was a little bigger than me. I was seeing my own style and you know, my own change happening where it was like, okay, I'm, I'm getting better at this. I'm getting more confident. So that, so my, my number one tip is if you're not on a schedule and you don't have a habit, like start with that. And I'd almost do that. Like James clear, like make it ridiculously small type thing mm-hmm, so that you stick mm-hmm. with it. That's what I did for sure. Two is to just be curious and new things, you know, and cause I look at sketch noting, e- even in sketch noting, um, there's so many areas where it's just, not being applied right so it was one of those things where it's like there was a small community of us i'm certainly not the only one but there was a small community of us making sketch notes around church you know hearing sermons or whatever but there's so many other areas and interests of things that people are into there's so many topics to introduce i mean it's just it's outstanding so there's somebody out there who has an interest in sketch noting and an interest in something else and it's like man if they put those two together like it would be something special because mm-hmm. uh, people don't see it you know it's funny if you're not in the sketch noting community and then somebody draws out something that you have an interest in and it makes it accessible i don't know there's something special to that for sure at least i found that and then three just i get a lot of inspiration from you know people on social media i hate to keep coming back to this like oh just get on social media and and interact but meeting new people getting new ideas uh hearing new things seeing what other people are doing a lot of that has propelled what what i've been doing with sketch notes um and also just not relying specifically on one discipline because i think it's easy to Mm -hmm. follow people who just do one thing but for me, like, I really like following comic book artists, you know, and seeing how they tackle anatomy and, and placement and how do they set up their panels and how do you make, you know, something more exciting. So I think there's that there's that element of taking your sketch notes and applying them to something that hasn't been applied before, but taking a discipline that you enjoy in the creation and applying that as well. You know, I'm sure somebody who is really into calligraphy or into scripting, you know, could do really good with sketch notes or somebody, you know what I mean? Where it's like just just odd mixture of things that haven't been done before. And I think the social media part helps because while we don't do it for likes and follows and all that stuff, I don't know. It's it's nice when you get the feedback, like like. You know, at the beginning, when you get 10 people to like something that you don't know who they are, it's like, wow, okay, maybe I'm on the right path here. Maybe I'm doing something, you know, that's kind of interesting. So, yeah, I guess my advice is get on social media and and go for it. (laughs) (laughs) Get interacting. (laughs) Right, yeah. And I guess it's more like awareness and then blending what you do with, uh, with this other thing, like make something new by doing a remix, right? So, yeah, yeah, 100%. For That's sure. Really cool. Yeah. Because I'm sure there's stuff that you've learned from the comic book space that you've applied to your sketchy sermons, right? So 
I could see it when I look at it. I got a feeling that that's come from there and you've had influences, probably some you can identify and many you can't, that have caused you to do things, right? So exposing yourself and uh, will change your work and, and make it your own. So that's really great. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's one one project I haven't gotten to that I've teased a few times, and and it was an idea that I threw out on Twitter. I was like, "What if we, what if all the pastors we lumped them together as like a superhero team or reimagine them as the Avengers?" And I got so many comments about like, "Oh, this person would be Wolverine, and this person would be mm. Spider Man," and it's totally ridiculous and it's silly, but it was like such a neat exercise to think about. Like, let me take this mm-hmm. world that you know, like. Uh, surprise I'm into comic books (laughs) like this world that I enjoy with this other world that I'm interested in and like mash them together in a way that hasn't been done before which is a little scary because I haven't done like action type Mm -hmm. content before so it's Mm -hmm. a little little bit of a learning curve but I don't know we'll see keeps you on your toes right for sure (laughs) Renee Stevens I guess my first tip would be Uh, try it. Um, I think you can't really understand the full power or potential without experiencing it. So it's like, you know, if there's an app that you know that has AR, um, like specifically try it. Like if you have never used the measure app, I think, you know, that's built in. So that's a great starting point. You know, maybe just start paying attention to where AR might already exist in your life and just start, hey, that that's AR. Renee was mentioning that. Like, I just think like observing it if and then again testing it like finding different uh experiences that uh use ar and like if you have never like see like viewed an object in your room like um you know mike you had mentioned earlier you know try that and see what and you know just pay attention to the experience like what part of it is beneficial to you what part isn't as beneficial to you you know um and kind of just kind of figuring that out i think that would be my suggestion is just start with something (laughs) try it um because then you can really start to see and learn how it could be useful for your own your workflow and your own process but I'd also at the same time say, start with what you do know about that and, and never be afraid to stop learning because, you know, constantly these, this technology is evolving and every day it's getting a little bit easier and a little bit more approachable. So I think that would be my first tip. Uh, my second tip, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier, but um, th- this idea of finding rhythms, I think r- routine is so much more reliable than inspiration. So um, I would say if there's something that you're, you know, tr- trying to to do, like if you're trying to, you know, kind of break out of the everyday mundane something that's happening in your life or this this world of the pandemic we're living in i think kind of building in a time to create and kind of doing it at the same time each day is kind of builds this routine and like i said there's a rhythm to it it kind of gets you into this flow and that becomes so much more like your body almost like prepares for it and that is so much more kind of like reliable than like just waiting for the inspiration to strike and then start creating something and then um yeah, this idea of rectangles and just thinking out, like breaking outside of the rectangles. I think my suggestion to you is to, is really to think outside and there's no box required. <laughs> like just go outside um, because I feel like there's so much unexpected things that can occur by being outside um, versus being inside that can really inspire you or can just really open your eyes to this world of breaking beyond the rectangles. Um, So that would be my third point. Andy McNally. You know, some of these are going to sound, anybody that's seen my Instagram feed, some of these were probably mentioned in my my, uh, tips, sketchnote tips post. But the first one that I, that I, that I, recommend is just is especially like when you're thinking about the drawing aspect of it I think that most of us have a handwriting and and our handwriting is distinctly ours but when we're trying to think about drawing and and obviously it's ideas and not art but it's remembering to break things down into their basic shapes circles mm-hmm. squares etc and one of my all-time favorite uh, references and artists that I admire for that has actually books on these that are kids books I'm going to say that they're not kids' book, but it's uh, the artist and author Ed Emberley, and he has these books yep. on drawing, and where he takes it's Ed Emberley's Draw World, and there's uh, I forget how many there are, there's like eight or nine of them, and he breaks things down like all right, I'm going to start with a circle, and then I add a square, and it's just this perfect tool. I have at least seven of them on my my shelf over here, mm-hmm. and 
I will often, if I know that I'm going to a conference to sketch note, one of those is going in my suitcase or bag with me just so that when I get a little bit overwhelmed right before I get there because, you know, like when it's sort of that performance of like, I've got a captions event and right. I've been hired to do it. Um, I'll look at one of those just as a reminder, even though may, none of it may be anything that I'm, I'm going to draw. It's just like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's shapes. Like just break it down. It's lines, shapes, squiggly lines, filled, filled in lines. So I think that that's uh, definitely hmm. look up at Emily if you, if you don't know who he is. His books are wonderful. Uh, he's an amazing artist. Uh, inspirational too. So basic shapes. Remember that. That's tip number one. Tip number two. And I mentioned this a minute ago when I was talking about my style, and hopefully maybe this resonates with others, is to remember that you can add details and color later, focus on capturing whatever it is, whether it's you know where you are right at the moment, try to capture the information, the details, the important objects, you know, too, if it's something you're trying to capture in, in terms of drawing. And remember that you can add details later. And um, one of the things, too, that I, that I found about that that technique of doing that, of adding details, embellishments, and color later on, is it also gives me a minute to go back and review the note too. Like it's this wonderful mm -hmm. way of of going back and, and rethinking and then maybe adding something because your your mind is triggered by by looking at it. And especially like for students, this is an excellent way to review your class notes. Like uh, for yes. me in college, that was when I was going back and adding colors, and occasionally I would completely redraw the note because I was about to take a test or an exam. It was a way for me to recall the information and remember things that I either left out, forgotten, or omitted, or to just spend more time drawing or doodling and thinking about that that visual that wanted to go with it because that cemented the idea in your head even, even more succinctly at the time. So I, I think for me, it, it became both a necessity just in the, the way, because I, I do write really slow. I know that when I, I can draw much faster than I can, can, can do my handwriting. And um, so it, it allowed me moments later to, to kind of catch my breath. That would, when I was at the WWC, when they were, they were showing a product video, I would stop for a minute and look down because product video, it was just, you know, marketing, uh, no offense to the Marcom team at Apple, they're wonderful and I'm friends with many of them. But um, that was my moment in, in person to, to take a break and look down and make sure that I got everything that I needed to capture for a second was when they would show product videos and commercials. So, because I could watch those later. So. Tip number three, and I've, I've got one fourth a bonus tip, if you will. Um, but tip number three is don't be afraid to leave blank space or you know, a space blanket. And this is twofold, like white space is important, I think, for, for composition, especially those of us that are designers have done that for a trade. We, we know the importance of allowing things to breathe. But, but then there's a second thing too. I would occasionally know what I wanted to draw for the sketch note, but I knew that I might need something to look at just for a second. Like, even though I knew it was gonna be simple, I might need a reference. And so occasionally I'll have a pencil with me when I'm, especially at a live event, and I'll just sort of make a circle covering the space I want to cover, and then make a, a quick note in pencil so that I can erase it later on. Let's say that it was, I drew a Dr. Evil in a, a sketch note a few years back. I don't even remember actually what it was for, but I knew that I couldn't remember exactly what Dr. Evil looked like, but I knew that I wanted Dr. Evil in there. And um, so I, I just wrote, Put a big circle there and i put dr evil and left it blank because i knew that i wanted to fill that in later on and so it's it's like not don't be afraid to to do that for for that reason too like you you can come back to this because the important thing is you keep up with you know what the speaker's saying or what's going on and you can fill that in after the fact and then just noticing too like okay maybe maybe leaving some room for for things to breathe whether it's a heading a title whether it's a, you know something that you've added to embellish you know just you know it's okay to leave a little space around there and then uh, my bonus tip, which actually isn't really related to the sketch notes himself, but it's really sort of some of the things that you and I have talked about uh, in our journeys along the way, is just keep learning new things. Like we were talking about the software just a minute ago, like try out new stuff. Like you never know what's gonna you know, resonate with you. Like I didn't know when I ordered the, the, the pen from, from Japan whether I was gonna like it or not, but I thought I wanna try this. Like it looks, it looks interesting. And the same thing for software too. Like I've been pleasantly surprised by things and whether it's technology, books, articles, things like that. And I think that hopefully with sketchnoting, I think that a lot of us are, are learners. It seems like there's a common thread throughout the, the sketchnote community that we're all 
uh, often interested in these things that we're capturing. And we're going to gravitate to those. Obviously, we're sometimes hired to, to do things that are outside of our fields and uh, we get to capture them. And, and the beautiful thing about that is we get to learn about something new. And so, yeah, keep learning new things, you know, whether it's book, software, tools. Sophie Lang. So one of the things that came to mind about this question is it's, a, it's, um, it's an idea of Andy J. Pizza. And uh, of course, I'm paraphrasing, but I think he was talking about that if you want to make good illustration, first you have to understand what good is for you. So when talking about sketch notes, I think one of the things that I would do is I would do it over, I, w- I would listen, blah, blah, blah. I would look at a couple of um, sketch notes works that that I think are awesome and uh, and I would not try to copy the way they do things instead I would like to uh, I would try to analyze what mm. is it that I like about this so this guy he's really great in in drawing faces and mm-hmm. getting the expression and then this guy is or this girl is really good at typography and then this other person is great at color so I would, I, would, I would try to understand what I like about mm. somebody else's work and then incorporate a little bit of that into what I'm uh, doing. Mm. And then uh, another tip could be, and this was something that has helped me a lot, I think, initially, was, was um, this, this journaling thing. I know it's not for everybody, uh, yes. but for me, what was great about it is uh, it, it was mostly about what happened. And obviously, uh, what happened that day. And so my memory, it's not very good, unfortunately. I'm one of those people. Mm. So for me, it was great to, to see, all right, here are the three things that happened today. I had coffee in this coffee shop, which was amazing. I went for a walk and it was awesome. And there was this tree. And then I, I talked to my friends on the phone and I listened to this podcast. And this is what happened today. Obviously, this was before I had children because since I have children, <laughs> my days don't look like this anymore. But yeah. that's also a good thing. It's not a problem. It's, it's different, a, yeah. It's a good thing. It's different. So um, I think what's good about this is, if you're into it, of course, is that there is just so much material that you can practice drawing. So basically what you're doing is... is you're just you're just expanding your visual vocabulary and you're thinking about metaphors. And that's what you do in sketch notes. But the difficulty with sketch notes is that the the clock is ticking. So mm-hmm. I will try to find opportunities uh, to practice uh, to to expand your your uh, your visual vocabulary and to practice uh, your metaphors. Uh, mm-hmm. And one way to do that is is to draw uh, in a diary or journal. Mm-hmm. format of course there must be other ways but this is the way mm-hmm. that i did it so this would be number two and then number three i think uh when i started um doing this um one of the things that was super uh difficult for me to comprehend is is what you call mental cachet in your book and we spoke about mm-hmm. it uh, briefly mm-hmm. it, uh, it's how like how on earth can i keep three ideas in my head at the same time this is not possible this is not possible this is just too difficult and uh, and i think people could get discouraged when they are starting out or or when they are hitting a plateau because this this is really hard it's, it's mm-hmm. a hard thing and uh, and and the, the, what i would like to say is that if you if you if you keep at it you will be surprised that one month later uh, one thing that was that was difficult one month ago you would just you would just find that oh I remember I remember this uh, better than I did I just remember more I can just keep more things in my head at the, at the same time so so that would be okay but this is not real advice I would I would just say just keep at it don't and don't get discouraged and if you if you mm. allow me to add the fourth point, Go for it. This, this would this would be uh, is that um, I told you that when I when I when I do analog work I I do the pencil thing and when I do digital work I do a similar thing because mm-hmm. I have another layer and I have the opacity on half and mm-hmm. I would have my uh, I would have my um, text and typography on layer one 
and then I would have all my all my sketches on layer two with this mm-hmm. with this half uh, opacity. And so what this what this what this um, helps me do is that so the speaker is talking about this idea, and then I would I would be like, oh, I have this visual metaphor in my head, but I don't have time to draw the whole thing mm-hmm. because I have to listen. So I go to layer number two, and I, I draw something that. I would say like you know like a little thumbnail or something yeah, really and then rough. and then when I have when the speaker is like now it's a little bit of a blah 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 and now I would go back to my draft and so so I, so this would be this would be a little hack which is which mm. works for me and it, it's it's mm-hmm. basically drafting so that that's what I do because that that's mm. my style and I think it helps me maybe make it more visual because I don't have to because I can do two two things at the same time you can yeah, sort of jump, jump around a bit yeah, yeah it's almost like it's, it feels like in the physical world it would be like working on a sketch note on a, in a book or a page and you're not you don't want to commit anything to the page yet so maybe you get a sticky note and you do a little scribble right and you keep it on the side and then you leave a space there and then when you get done, you're like, oh, that's right. Oh, that one. Oh, that's. And then you would fill it in when you have the time, right? You're not. You take the time pressure out of it and you come back to it later. Because, you know, you. I imagine, like me, you take maybe 10, 15 minutes after you're done, even in a one and done session, to look for typos, to see, could I move this over? Is that too big? Like all these little things that we do just to kind of finalize it. You know, you set it. And that's the time when you can come in and, oh, there's an empty spot. Oh, that's right. Layer layer four. Oh, that's right. I want to draw this, and you hide it, and you draw it again, right? So, something like Absolutely. that. I suspect is happening. It's for commitment, folks. You, yeah. And you don't want to commit. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> it's for commitment, folks. That's yeah. funny. Andrea Skertner. So the next level would be the first thing. Would this would this be? You know, these two mm-hmm. levels of information: use gray and you mm-hmm. use black. So this for me was more than just the one percent. Um, optimization in my work so this is an easy one just to try it out two levels of information gray and black Mm -hmm. Uh, then there's um, the second tip from my point of view is um, you have to practice so shut up do it this is the (laughs) the second practice uh, the second tip from my side because it's if you don't if you don't do it more than just once you're not getting better so uh, it's you know it's it doesn't matter if you if you make a if you are playing a piano or doing a sport. So you have to to um, do it more than once, do it twice, and and so on and so on, and, and then you are getting better. So this is the second tip: shut up, do it. <laughs> and the third one is um, make your drawing or sketching process visible to the customer. Mm. Make it visible. Don't hide it. You know, like oh, it's 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 my it's my only. Uh, um, you know, it's nobody can is allowed to see what I'm doing here. Um, yeah. You have to 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 think about that for the customer. It's so much value to see you drawing. You know, um, and he sees what you're doing. So this is a huge step from my point of view to. Yeah, to, to get into the pro mode, you know, to the to the professional uh, area where you show the process of drawing and share it with your client. In, a, in the first call, for example, the first call where you get to know each other, start to draw and show it while you're talking. This is really, um, it's like a rocket, you know, that starts from the bottom because the client sees what you're doing and he, sa- and he, he thinks or she thinks, wow, what a what a professional one! You know, she or he is, is drawing while we're talking. Oh my god, I want to book this guy or this girl, you know, yeah, for the next yeah. uh, sketch note event or stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So these are yeah, my that's, that's great. three tips. Yeah. Franziska Schwartz. I would be telling them because I hit that point every once in a while too. That's one mm-hmm. reason why I didn't study art because I thought I'm not getting any further, I'm not getting better. What I didn't know back then. What helps me a lot is copy other artists. So mm. I really buy a whole book of one, but that the style I like. And um, if there's not a program like this, or they don't have a book like that, really I start copying to understand their lines, their way of thinking. Mm. And um, usually that way I get in contact with them and can ask them. They usually are nice, they, they like that. <laughs> um, if that's not something, because it works well for comic styles um, and some others, um, 
then I have this uh, some kind of French book line. I can give you the link later. It's I found it on accident, and it's a really fun book for visual experiments. Like they give you mm. two images, like a banana and a shoelace, and you're supposed to match them. So you're making imaginary images of, of something that doesn't exist, but they always look so funny. They and they have these mm. exercises in these books. Um, so and it's the only brand that I know so far that that does mm, that, and it's, it's really fun. And um, another thing, which is more related to to drawing, I know to writing, is I really can calm down by writing, rewriting poems. I'm copying mm. them actually. So I'm I'm cleaning out my handwriting quite often in a year, and I have this this wonderful author. He's by chance, actually, he's a biochemist, <laughs> and hmm. but he's a, he's a great poet, and he has this fun hmm. way of writing poems. So whenever I need lettering practice, I chose his poems and just write on big paper on the walls. And hmm. uh, my niece loves it because the poems are funny, and she yeah. understands them. Um, and I notice as a side effect that I really can calm down. I have other ideas with that. Hmm. I'm trying new pens, and. Um, it, it somehow I can really just yeah it, it slows me down that's actually mm. the effect and it brings great creativity it, it's just a nice mm. input by doing something not really drawing but just by writing and if the pen goes dry if it breaks it's okay then it did its job and I know exactly how long I could draw with it <laughs> and I have have these these wonderful walls um, just of handwriting it's fun mm. Well, that's really great. Uh, copying, I think, is a huge thing. I think we in the West sort of discount it. I, I've read some articles that in Asian culture, specifically Japanese culture, it's very popular to copy. That's a common way to learn. I really like it because you tend to deconstruct, I think what you were saying, you're deconstructing how that person thinks and then reformatting it in the way that you can use it. So naturally speaking, as hard as you try to copy them, it's always going to have your own style attached to it. So there's a there's a way to make it more your style, which is, I think, a really great way to go. That's the way I think of what I think I real what I realize when I look at layouts. Um, mm -hmm. I look at other people's layouts and I deconstruct why they work and what were the conditions in which they use that technique and why did it work. So you, if you go deep enough into that, you start to you have com almost like modules or components. That yeah. um, in this situation, these couple of things work really well for that context, so I'll use that. Rather than, I think a lot of times you can get um, do a layout and you sort of get locked into it, and then things, the speaker changes or something breaks down, and suddenly your structure doesn't work anymore because it's so rigid. Yeah. So thinking about it modularly can often help. So that's a really great. That's yeah. really encouraging tip. And sometimes after it, it's sunk in, after weeks or months. There will be that, that one moment where you need it. I noticed that with the drawing hands, like I took the, the mm. class from Nadine that she put out and I, mm -hmm. there were some, some positions, uh, they just don't work for me, I can't do it. Um, yeah. But then there's this one recording and in my mind, I have really the, the pieces of the puzzle that fit together and I get there faster. And sometimes on the wall, I'm just like, wow, that for some reason that worked. My, my mind and my muscles were, didn't know how to do it, even though I couldn't remember what it was in there. So mm. you incorporate it into your style, into your lines. And that's the fun part about sketch noting, about drawing. If you, of course, if you don't practice, you don't get better. But right. um, most of the time it doesn't feel like practice. No matter what you do, um, you always grow. So you don't have, it's not like, like hard training, not like learning something by yeah. heart. You're just doing it because you're using the tool and your mind and your body keeps on growing on and really manifests the technique. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. Kind of goes like underground and still yeah. something is happening there. It's amazing. It's like planting a seed. You start living into it, right? Yep. This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, an infinite canvas sketching app built for tablets with a stylus, like the iPad Pro, Microsoft Surface, and Samsung Galaxy Tab. 
Concept's Infinite Canvas lets you spread out and sketch in any direction. Everything you draw in Concepts is a flexible vector, so you can move your notes around the canvas or change their color, tool, or size with a simple gesture. Search Concepts in your favorite app store for infinite, flexible sketching. Adrian Liard. Well, uh, this is, I think, a, a good but very difficult question yeah. because it really depends where you are on your journey. Uh, but let me try. Uh, so I think the most basic and universal tips uh, you can give to someone who wants to get better or, or yeah, get over a plateau uh, is practice. Uh, practice and practice again. <laughs> I think this is the best advice you can give, but people don't really want to hear that. Uh, they are looking you know, for the, for the shortcuts. What brush are you using? What app are you using? What book did you read? What online course did you follow? Like, if they're trying to find the, the, the magic stick you know, that will make them improve instantly, and, and the truth is there is no shortcut, right? There is no magic stick. You have to practice a lot to get good at this. But I think there is a problem with this advice. Uh, it's good, but there is a problem with it. And this is why I think people get frustrated. Because you tell people to practice, but you don't tell them oh, uh, and, and what to avoid in order to practice uh, in an effective manner. Uh, you don't really give them example when you do that. And when you're just starting on when you reach plateau, you, you need, I think, really concrete steps and guidance. Uh, and there is, I think, some principles that you can apply in order to practice in an efficient manner you know uh, first i think that regularity uh, i think is key it is probably better to practice five minutes every day mm -hmm. than practice let's say eight hour on some months mm -hmm. on cinemas uh, so try to find a, a sustainable sustainable rhythm to and stick to it i think quantity is more important than quality when it comes to to practice really if your goal when you practice is to do like the best catch note ever then the, the probability that you will fail is really high yeah. <laughs> and you will get discouraged and you will stop practicing which is not a good thing obviously uh, so I think it's better to use quantity uh, mm. as a measure of success uh, like okay we do one sketch note every day for a whole week I think that's a, a better goal mm -hmm. uh, because even if those sketch notes are pretty bad the chance that you will learn something is really high and this is what you are looking for when you are practicing learning not doing a great piece and and as humans we learn by trial and error so uh, uh, you don't have to show them obviously uh, they don't have to be good you just have to stick to your schedule show up focus on the quantity on the number you've set up as your measure of success so I think that's yeah a, a good way uh, and one other important thing when it comes to practice is to inspect your work mm. from time to time and try to find areas where you think you need to improve and then try to design experiment and exercises to specifically train those weaknesses you have. Uh, external feedback may help here, but uh, once you've identified those areas of improvement, let's say, uh, you want to focus on, uh, basically you need to do more of what hurts. You know, uh, because this is all you grow muscle by stretching yeah. out of your comfort zone. You know, so let me give you a concrete example of that. Uh, let's say that you are struggling with keeping up with the amount of content when the speaker talk really quickly. Uh, you think you think you don't capture enough content, which is something that people ask me often. So let's try to design an exercise to grow that muscle. So what you need to do is to you need to find speakers that talk really fast. You do. You need to do more of what hurts, and there is actually a really easy way to do that. You go to YouTube, you find a, a TED talk, and you set the playing speed to two x. <laughs> you do that for ten talks, it will hurt. Your sketch note will be very bad, probably. The amount of capture content will be pretty low, but when you will come back to normal speed, it will feel a lot easier because you will have grown that muscle you know uh, another concrete example you are really bad at drawing let's say bikes bikes are really hard to draw right uh, what do you do well you do more of what hurts you go on google image you search for bike images and you draw a uh, hundred bikes in your sketchbook after drawing 100 bikes you will be better at drawing them and you will probably be able to draw them from memory right mm -hmm. um, so yeah i think that's helpful uh, 
so that would be my second tip. Okay, one last tip uh, that I think is really helpful. Uh, don't do any sketch note or graphic recording. Don't fo focus on one particular type of drawing. Try to expand to other type of drawing. Mm. Draw from life, for example. I think that drawing from observation is probably the single best thing uh, you can do in order to improve your drawing skills and your visual thinking skills. Uh, because I've, it will teach you that drawing does not happen on the paper, you know? Drawing happens in our head. Yeah. Uh, drawing is about observing something, understand what shapes makes the form you see, and finally tracing those shapes on paper. And I think you could just practice looking at something, try to understand the shapes, and not tracing anything on paper. And honestly, I think it still counts at pra practicing your drawing skills, you know? Uh, drawing from life uh, really teach you that drawing is first about seeing, about close observation. Uh, and you quickly realize uh, that the process is the same when you draw from imagination or when you visualize an abstract concept. We don't need our eyes to see or to observe something. Uh, this is, I think, the true magic of visual thinking when you think about it. Being able to see without actually looking at something or even being able to see things that don't have a, a, a physical form, processes, timelines, concepts. And I think that, yeah, drawing from life is a great way to, to practice this and to, to realize this. Hmm. Chris Neckelman. I think I will um, give you some three tips that I, I use actually all the time. Uh, I, I had write it right here. Let me see. Uh, one, I mean, the first one is look for people uh, you like their work. Mm. Uh, look for reference and, and try to analyze how they work, how they do the lines, how they do the, the letters, the colors. Um, maybe try to find someone who has a different type of work that you do. You, you do. I mean, for example, someone who use um, Oh, how is the name in English? Uh, aguarela in Spanish is Probably oh like, the name in English. like watercolor. Like, uh, maybe? Yeah, watercolor. That's the name. Watercolor. For example, I don't use watercolor. So find someone who uses watercolor. How did you use it? Maybe you can try it once, and if it don't work for you, don't use it. But you had um, this beautiful path. That path. I'm sorry that you understand and and try to understand that new technique and maybe you can mix it and use it in a different way because you're working with different tools so I, I think that, that can help a lot it's like a, like a, a Austin Cleon like a, still like an artist yeah, yeah. it's like a, that, that way and I think that can help you understand the fundamentals of the different uh, techniques and create your own formula, of course. Uh, the second tip, uh, this is important, I think, patience. Mm. Patience, practice, and try something different. Uh, but a lot of patience. Uh, I think everyone wants to create beautiful sketch notes or graphic records or anything right away. Uh, now, it's a process. Uh, when when I read, uh, read your book, I, I found a lot of different uh, styles there, and I tried to do it. I copy literally copy yeah, yeah. But a lot of drawings in my in my notebook to understand this. And I watched my my very first sketch and uh, was the other one in the book. I said, "Oh, this is so ugly," but it's my process. Yeah. And now I'm very proud of it. So that's my third um, tip. Show your work, show your evolution, show mm. honor your path and honor mm. uh, what things uh, bring you where you are now. And all the things that you went uh, through on what you have learned and all of that, I think you have to show it. And, and that's the way to understand what you... Um, you learn, but also can help others to say, oh, first, very first uh, jobs of Chris was very ugly and now she's doing this. Okay, I can do it. So I, I think I can 
that make uh, can make a connection with the people to understand that we are not gods and goddess. We are people like you, and you can do it too. I, I think that's the my three tips. Mm, those are great tips. I especially like the last one, showing the process. I just did that um, two weeks ago with Diana Soriat, where we were, oh, we were yeah, showing some really old sketch notes that I I looked around in my shelves and I found like the oldest little pocket moleskin with my first sketch notes in it and was showing that on camera and what I was thinking at the time and it is so different like I look at it and there's elements of it I see oh I see I still kind of do this thing but it's um, improved over time but I yeah. kind of do the same thing it's just that I've practiced enough to kind of refine it and then there's some things like you know I did it only in one color it was in a small book and it was sort of it had its own style and I don't I don't really do that style the same anymore so it is sort of a both a memento of the past, but also there the elements, the foundations are there, right? If you if you mm. look at the connection, the style is there, but it just is new. Like I hadn't figured it out yet, and it took time to exactly. process over time. You know, that's a great idea, and I think that's good. It's good to be reminded where you came from, and I love that idea that everything is a part of your story. Maybe even the things that you're not as proud of. Because if you didn't have those things, it wouldn't move you into a new direction. The story of you. So what happens to Chris Neckelman if you uh, never get fired from the bank job? Maybe you're still working at the bank and you're not doing any of this stuff now, right? Like mm. you think about how that, how life could have changed if something slightly different happened, you know? Mm. Actually, I think uh, maybe it, it, I, I wasn't fired. I think... Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, I can work in UX or Agile. I think right. it will be something similar. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm. I don't know. I'm part of this. I, I can be in another place. I think so. Maybe in a different um, enterprise, but uh, in, in the same part of the techniques or or. No, yeah. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, but it's the same thing. <laughs> the same it, kind of work. <laughs> I kind of wonder too, like, you know, when when the time came when you left that company, like, you talked a little bit before we began about how when your dad passed away, it sort of made you rethink mm -hmm. what was most important to you. So you started to think, like, maybe you were thinking even, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? Like, mm -hmm. you'd done it for six years, you knew how to do it pretty well, and you sort of maybe had reached a peak, like you talk about always wanting to improve in your current practice maybe it was just you realizing like I've re I've reached the point where I can't get any better I'm my contributions have sort of reached their peak and maybe now it's time for someone else to do that and to grow but I need to do something else and you know in your grief with your father you just couldn't see it or you know and obviously that you said that the being released from that was really positive for you so it's kind of interesting to see. It would be interesting to go back and reflect on on that. I'm sure you have many times. So, <laughs> yeah, a lot. I, I think um, that moment was very important to understand where I want to live, mm. when. I mean, when in, in, in the sense of I want to live in this kind of um, moment of stress people and business people who are mm. working and, and moving all the time uh, very stressful people with the phones and I want that or I want to live a life with my family mm. and I remember myself a month uh, before my dad died um, saying dad I can talk right now I have to go because I have a lot of work mm. didn't happen a lot of time but uh, I remember that moment and now I'm I have the moment to stay with my daughter, stay with my husband, stay with my family, and also working what I love. And I don't have someone like a boss telling me, uh, you have to do that. So I'm, I'm working on my own um, purpose, not for, for other purpose, from other people. Yeah. So I think that um, was the real moment for me. Well, it's really, I'm glad that you made that choice and that life turned that way because you're making a real contribution to the community. And I love that you're focusing on Spanish language because I have this sense. So I've talked to, I've made an effort to try and find people in Mexico and South America and Spain and people who, and also 
I need to find some Portuguese speaking too because I think there's a whole community that is there but I don't know how much it's served I guess you could tell me more like I know my book never got translated to Spanish I don't know why I've pursued other Spanish language publishers and none have been interested so but I know that there's a community there and I know there's a people ready for it obviously there are people like you so I'm really happy to hear that you're doing that you're that you're going that direction I think it's so necessary Siri so Thank you for that work you're doing and the work you will do because I think you're having a positive impact. We're a lot. We are a lot in Latin America, especially. I think so. I think yeah, so. and there's a beautiful community in Colombia, in Argentina too. Um, in Brazil, uh, we don't speak the same language. Portuguese right. is different yeah. from Spanish. Yeah. We can understand a few words, but. but uh, there are people too in, in, yeah. in Brazil, um, in Uruguay, uh, in Paraguay. There's a lot. There's yeah. a lot um, in Costa Rica yeah. too. That yeah. is in Central America. Yeah, but there's a lot of people uh, who are working a lot. They know a lot, yeah. and they want to contribute. And we have a beautiful WhatsApp group. <laughs> It's, mm. I think it's the only WhatsApp group I really like to have, <laughs> and yeah, right. because we are so um, generous. Mm. If you have a question, I don't know how to do this. I, I don't know how to um, what, what, what uh, can pay me for this. Uh, yeah. How can I do it? Uh, yeah, you can do this. Blah, 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 blah. So it's a very helpful community, mm. and and it's really really beautiful and there's a lot of people so uh, that's why I started um, uh, two years ago I think yeah maybe two years ago I started my uh, contribution with IVP I was a board mm -hmm. member of IVP mm -hmm. I have to get it away because uh, I, I was pregnant so I have to focus on my pregnancy uh, so I, I, I'm not there now but there's two people one from Mexico I and mean, it's Canadian but from Mexico and she speak beautifully Spanish and English too so she's a very good one and also someone from Brazil so now we have more people in the board of IVP uh, to represent ourselves so uh, I think that's very beautiful beautiful mm. Lai Chi Chu so the first the first tip I would like to share is uh, that 33% people rule. Mm. Um, so you have to, yeah, 33% 30, 30 of the people are starters, for example. So you can help them, you can advise them, but in return, you get the questions. So you can reflect on them. You, we take things for granted and we never think about what we do. So mm. then it, 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 it gives you a, a momentum to think about. Uh, 32% is about peers. Uh, so I do, for example, challenges with peers uh, uh, and, and you, you, you held uh, each other accountable. So that is a nice way to just keep growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the other 33% is someone who is uh, can be a mentor or coach. Uh, and that can be on uh, drawing, but it can also be in business, of course. For it, it doesn't matter whatever if you if you have uh, if you want to be a solopreneur or you want to do a little bit of business with your drawings uh, make sure that you have someone uh, who can mentor you um, on business or on drawing or whatever I usually just take uh, for the drawing I take courses from different people uh, because you get feedback uh, if I show it to people I know they say yeah it's a nice drawing yeah it, it doesn't really help me so <laughs> I need really concrete feedback uh, on things that I can improve so that is that is tip number one. Uh, tip number two: I always hear people say, "Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have time to practice icons, even the twenty seconds uh, doodles in uh, in, the, in the sketch note army." Apparently, sometimes it's it's a thing. Uh, if that for me is a mindset thing, I see drawing as a reward. So if I do some task that I really do not like, I have at the end of the of the when I finish the task, the drawing is a reward. Hmm. So um, that that's a shift. So or I see it as a little break, but I don't see it as a task. So that, that could help if you see it like that. And uh, the third one is, yeah, post as much work as you can. I also had a little bit of uh, an issue or it was a huge barrier for me to post, start posting it on uh, Instagram. I started over there. But actually uh, everyone, uh, if, if you 
post it, people will notice you, if, especially want you, if you want to go into that business. Uh, and people will find you and go into the communities, right? To the 33% people rule, you will find people in the communities. I get so many nice contacts with people and uh, uh, different uh, resources that I can check out or, yeah, you just learn so much. Mm. Those are three great tips. Yeah. I like the 33% rule. That's I have never heard that one. That's a really cool one. Yeah, and especially also in communities, you know, there are always people uh, uh, that are starting and always people that are far behind. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you can learn from both. So there's no right. Now that you defined it, it's like, I think back to all the communities or situations I've been, it's been, that's held true what you've said. I've just never thought about that, the, that, that number in my head. Yeah. So that's yeah. pretty interesting. You can switch roles, of course, as well. Eh? I, I yeah. mean, uh, sometimes I'm a mentor and sometimes I'm just a student. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's good to be both, right? I like to take yeah. courses too because even as a trainer, I learn, like a lot of times I'll even take a course to learn how do they deliver it? What are they doing that's different that I'm not doing? What what little tidbit, oh, I really like what they did there. And if, I, if I'm friends with them or I can reach out to them, I'll ask them about that and then incorporate that into my own training yeah. uh, as a different way. So I think we're always learning from everything that we absorb, right? And then it's a matter of integrating that into our own practice which is yes. you know, interesting. And I, I would say the other thing I love is treating drawing as a as a reward, like having a little bit of chocolate or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, and if, if you're someone who, like, I'm starting to read this book, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Okay. And he talks a lot about how the story, like who we believe we are, drives what we do. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, the other thing that I believe in is layering things together that makes sense that, that reinforce each other. So yes, let's say you had a really tough task. I have to go rake the leaves or something. I don't know, picking something up, something you don't want to do, but as your reward, you get 30 minutes to draw and uh, two pieces of chocolate and a coffee. So I've exactly. always believed in that, like to, to encourage people to draw is to go. If you want to do drawing, mark off time for yourself when you used to be able to go to your favorite cafe, order your favorite coffee and get out your notebook and make it like, like reinforce it with all these other things that sort of layer up and make it like, oh, this is like a treat to me, right? So yes. now they all get tied together. So every time you have that chocolate, you think about the drawing or you have a coffee, you think about the drawing. And then when you're having, when you're drawing, you're thinking about the coffee and the chocolate, right? So they now become <laughs> integrated and they, the reward center in your mind uh, gets uh, hit even when you're not doing the other two parts. So that's a really yeah. great tip. Tan May Vora. Yeah, so when I started my sketchnoting practice, one of the things that served me really well was integrating, you know, the visual way of working in my everyday tasks. So for example, I would anyway do a to-do list. Uh, how do I turn my to-do list into some form of visual? Uh, for example, what I would do is that my to-do list uh, would define what I do in the day. But at the end of the day, I would sit back and reflect on how was my day today? How, how productive was I? Did I accomplish? Am I happy? And so on. And the simplest rating that I would give to each day uh, back in time was through a set of emoticons. So I would draw an emoticon mm. to represent the day. And I would say that today was a fantastic day or today was a neutral day or I wasn't happy with how I spent my day and so on. So, and, and then I extended that to, let's say, clean eating, exercising, and I would say that how do I review myself visually, right? So instead of tracking my goals on apps and stuff like that, I started tracking them in a, on a piece of paper in my diary um, with, with emoticons. So I think the simplest way to do it is to just start and keep at it and make it a part of a daily routine rather than trying to do it specially uh, in a day because mm -hmm. we, are, we are bombarded with information and priorities all the time. And if we just step back and do it in a, in a way that, sort of helps us become better, then we are not doing visual thinking. We are actually using sketch notes or visuals as a tool to improve ourselves. And I think that's a very powerful uh, way to also build your visual vocabulary, uh, make practice a part of your pursuit and, and not do it like, uh, you know, in a very grand sort of fashion. The second thing that helped me was that when I started sharing it with community, now people are looking up to me for sharing something meaningful all the time. And that sort of means that I have to keep up at it, right? So community keeps you at it. And it's easy to give up if you are doing it all alone. But if you are doing it in a community, uh, if you are sharing 
if you're doing what we're doing in the service of something or someone, I think that changes the whole perspective. The third thing is that uh, constraints have really helped me because I'm clear that I don't want to be the best sketch noter out there. Uh, I think uh, what I want to do is I want to use sketch notes and visual thinking as a tool to advance ideas. And so uh, I've given myself a lot of constraints back in time. As I said, I used to tear up a an A4 size paper into two and I would just use that small space to create a sketch note. Uh, now I have I work with fixed canvas sizes, a fixed set of brushes. Uh, so I don't have to think about how do I make this creatively beautiful and, and nice. That's not the point. The point is how do I represent and capture the idea most effectively. So constraints really help you keep on the track. Um, uh, you know, so we can throw in constraints like what kind of visuals we want to create, what colors we want to use, uh, what material, what type of tools we want to use. And those create, uh, they, they basically not just help you become more effective, but also uh, constraints helps us in uh, bringing out a unique uh, expression and unique style. Um, that's what I've learned. So these are like, these would be my top three things. Integrate visuals into your day-to-day -day flow of work, share it generously with the community, and then, you know, throw in some constraints and, uh, and, and build your own visual style. That's, that's very unique to, to you. William Warren. Yeah, the first thing I would do would be to give yourself, I would encourage people to give themselves boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a sense that like creativity flourishes best when you're just like unhindered and, 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 and yeah. free and floating and, and you can do all these things. I actually don't think that's true. I think creativity flourishes when in, in with restrictions, with boundaries. So if you find you're hitting a plateau, um, I would encourage people to um, give themselves artificial boundaries. Like mm. try doing it in black and white only, you know, try doing it without color, try uh, sketch noting really small, try doing it really big, um, try doing it digital if you're an analog guy, try doing it analog if you're a digital person. Um, I think boundaries are really healthy to, uh, to have, um, not just in creativity, but in life as well. <laughs> um, and um, so that's the first thing I would encourage, just, is just give yourself some, some boundaries. The second thing is, this is a visualization hack that I like, which is when I'm trying to think about how to visualize something, I imagine what would my favorite movie or TV show do with this idea or this concept. Mm. So um, I think you have, I think I saw you have a Mandalorian thing on the back yeah. on your wall. Is that right? Yeah. So like, if I'm thinking about this idea, how would this play out in a, in a scene in the Mandalorian? Like just kind of visualizing it as a movie uh, helps you kind of push yourself outside of your, um, out of your, out of your typical kind of creative That's a great tip. And then number three, number three, I would say pursue adjacent creative activities. So like if mm -hmm. you are, if you're someone who loves to draw and drawing is your thing, but you're hitting a plateau, then why don't you try painting? You know, bust out some paints, mm -hmm. try painting, see how that goes, or try music, try doing different things. I think that um, creativity is one of those things that as you pursue it in other areas, the adjacent areas will start to start to thrive as well. They'll, they'll be fed by that adjacent creative energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, think of things that you haven't done in a long time. Like I love oil painting. I, I did a lot of oil painting back when I was in college. And it's one of those things I'm like, I need to get back into it. Uh, but um, like, so yeah, if you, have a, if you have a creative thing that you used to love to do, like go back to that, try it out, um, try new stuff get together in groups, um, in like social social groups and, and do creative work together, feed off each other's energy. Um, Cause yeah, creative burnout and plateauing is a real thing. It's a real thing mm -hmm. that we don't talk uh, talk enough about. And I think there's a lot of strategies and tactics to, to mitigate that. Chris Wilson. The first thing I would say is, um, is, to, is to do, is, is kind of what I just said, which is to, to create something that's that's just for you rather than uh, mm. creating something that's you know maybe for public consumption and um, yeah that could be a um, you know, of, of a book it could be just playing around with uh, some hand lettering styles it could be you know trying to do some realistic style drawing like uh, real life or, or, or go the other way and do cartoonistic style mm. Uh, but um, you know, just just do something which is try and do something which seems interesting to you, and um, maybe doesn't you don't even think it would work for sketch notes, but but you would just enjoy it. So, 
could be watercolor painting or something like this i don't know um so i think i think that would be one because it you know often you'll find that there's some aspect of that style which you like and you could you could incorporate in so like taking watercolors well maybe you start doing some analog sketch notes again and you like do some watercolor uh in the background or, or, or something like that uh realistic drawing maybe you decide that um you want to change the style of uh you will add a like realistic portrait rather of a speaker at a conference rather than having the more cartoonistic style which you use elsewhere or or something like that so i think that would be one I think the next one I would say is uh, is just to shake up your tools and, and play around with them. Um, I really enjoy just trying out new tools like this. Um, I think it's very easy with analog, but uh, but can be great with digital as well. Just download a new set of Procreate brushes or something, try a new app. Uh, you know, this Bic pen, I, uh, I picked it up just because it was in the store. It was cheap. I thought I haven't had a... A, a gel pen for a while maybe it'll be nice to use and it, and it was pretty good um i also have i didn't mention these during the thing i have some dry highlighters on my desk as well uh which i got because i thought what's what on earth is a dry highlighter and uh mm. yeah i don't really use it for sketch notes but uh but it was fun to try out and see what it's like and um mm. and yeah then you may find that uh you know, you try a brush pen, and, and that starts to come into your your sketch noting style. Or uh, you know, by using using this uh, gel pen, which is really thin, um, it, it's thinner than a lot of the Pigma Microns that I was using. And then that encouraged me to use the small, the thinner Pigma Microns again, which I'd resisted because I'd broken one a few years back. Um, so I, I think that can that can be really good. And then connected to that, um, I, I like to have the, the mindset of um, what does this tool want to be used for um, and what does it not want to be used for and to try and play around with both of those um, aspects. So, so for example, like a, a brush pen wants to be these big sweeping gestures in my mind, like flowy actions, really wide corners, uh, lots of variation between thin and thick. And so you can you can play around with using a brush pen like that, doing really thick lines and stuff like this. But then you can also try and do the complete opposite, where you try and use it for details. And it, it but the brush pen doesn't want to be used for that because it it kind of wriggles away for you. And that can actually create this really interesting style as well, where you have you know you're trying to be precise, but it, it's just not there. And so then you kind of end up with something different from that or or like the gel pen which is the opposite it's it's firm it's stuck it's thin so um you know that's great for doing like these really careful details but then you want to do big filled in areas um well you have to kind of do actually don't know the correct term hatching i think it is or mm -hmm. way cross hatching yeah yeah things like this or or you could try and do like fake brush lettering with your Mm. Uh, your gel pen, your Pigma Micron, and, and and fill it in that way. And I think um, you know, taking those two things in mind, you can you can end up uh, finding some really interesting things that you may enjoy about uh, about the tools that you're using and uh, and new styles and uh, and develop more of that sense of your own. Scott H. Young. Well, I think one thing that I, I want to stress too is that I think the reason people gravitate toward tools is they see someone who produces just like brilliant work and the actual sort of mechanism that they produce the brilliant work is just inside their head, right? And so the only thing you can see is, well, what are they doing? What tools do they have? And so there is a sort of maybe wishful thinking that if I had the tools, then my drawings would look like theirs. I think the more helpful steps is, you know, if, if you're trying to produce sort of as a, as an amateur semi-professional, something that's actually going to be going out there and you're using it as opposed to just for your personal consumption, things that I found helpful is like learn the basics of drawing is probably helpful just so that, you know, you know how shapes work and how lighting works mm -hmm. and things like that. And then I think you have to, as you said, develop a kind of a visual language. So like there's little details on my blog, which I kind of, they're little like rules that I keep for drawing things that 
I don't state them anywhere. They're, they're not obvious, but if you look through, you could see them. Like for instance, when I draw stick figures, um, the, they never have any eyes. Uh, or facial features they're usually just a uh, head and occasionally i will draw a mouth if they have to have a mouth but i otherwise don't have a mouth and that's just like a particular thing whereas some people every stick figure would have eyes that's, that's like a normal thing to have on a stick figure um or things like usually if i have multiple stick figures and one is supposed to be the viewer uh, i use a particular color for that and so it's sort mm. of like a teal color uh, i also use i also don't use any natural skin tones for the colors for the the thing i mm. want it to be deliberately not like you know i'm having having that issue where it's like, okay, I've drawn some of them and they're a particular kind of ethnic skin mm-hmm. color or a white person or whatever. I don't want to have that in the images, but these are like little parts of the kind of visual language that I've kind of pieced together mm-hmm. over time. And so I think as you draw more images, you get certain, like, this is how I draw this and this is how I draw that. And this is why I draw it this way that I think you kind of figure out. And as you build that, because those rules are going to be yours and not someone else's, they're going to make your style look unique and, and on its own and stuff. And so I think that's just something that comes with, with practice. Mm. That's interesting. You've all, you've almost naturally stepped into the, the tips section. So I would call that your tip number one, which is sort of <laughs> build your own internal rules about drawing or yeah. visual visual rules i guess maybe that would be a describe that would be number one what would two other tips be that you've learned either from visualization or learning either one would be great don't worry about your stuff not looking good i think Mm. would be another thing i think especially if you're not trying to produce like commercially saleable art but you're just trying to convey Mm -hmm. ideas uh people i think they get really anxious about drawing right because they don't do it a lot and like ah my drawings aren't very good and I feel like the main lesson I got is that I had that same feeling is that I was like, oh, these images are just placeholders. And I was just really surprised how much people liked bad art, like mm-hmm. how much people liked mm-hmm. images that were just obviously not professional quality. And so I think that's something that I would lean into is that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, getting over your anxiety about it is, is important and just going out there and doing it because most people can't draw and most people like, you know, don't care about it. I think... Um, and I think this is particularly true when you're just trying to convey an idea. Uh, I think uh, people are more critical when you're trying to like, let's say make a painting where it's trying to look realistic. Mm -hmm. But when you're just trying to draw a doodle, which is abstract or, you know, just illustrates an idea very broadly, you can get away with a lot is, is I guess what I would say. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that's a really good one. What about a third tip? What would, what might be a third one you would give? Hmm. Um, I think the third one would relate to learning itself and it's just okay. the idea to reiterate what I said earlier, which is that for a lot of abstract ideas, um, if you can keep in the back of your head that you're looking for a way to have a mental picture of it, I think that often uh, directs your studying efforts or your learning efforts mm. better than if you are just sort of like, well, how do I memorize this? Um, and I will say, you know, you can also turn that into an impossible problem like i can't visualize it ah, and then it's giving you other stress so i don't want to create that burden on you but i think if you just keep that in the back of your head of like you know this is a tool that sometimes works of like finding a visual representation of this idea um, i think that can be quite powerful and for people who feel very comfortable with that that license to use visual images to represent ideas can be incredibly powerful. So I have spent years like kind of talking about these techniques with people and I find there's kind of two camps. There's the camp where it stresses them out because they can't find an image and then they're like freaking out about it and it's like, okay, okay, well, th- that's just one tool that you can use. But then there's other people who, where it's like, it clicks and it's freeing and it's sort of like, oh yeah, okay, now I can see this image and now when I want to recall the idea, I go back to my image and it's, it's easy to remember whereas before I wasn't doing that, I don't know why I wasn't doing that. And so, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think most of my university years I spent, it was like, how do I make an image out of this? Or how do I visualize what's going on? And then when people would say, well, like, how do you solve that puzzle? Or how do you figure it? It's like, well, I just go back to the image. And I just like, okay. You know, like, as I said, with the voltage and stuff, it's like, okay, well, what's the setup here? Well, uh, this can't be true because there'd be too much water coming out or something, you know, like mm-hmm. you just, you can just kind of infer it almost. And it, it sounds sort of mysterious and magical, but I think that it's only uh, it's only something that's mysterious or magical when you uh, when you can't see what they're doing, right? When you mm-hmm. can't see that they actually have some image that they're they're manipulating. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rody, and brought to you by Rody Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. 
To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.